Hello everybody. Hope you're all having a good week at the moment. You'll uh, have to excuse me, I've just come in from work and got changed. And, oh, hello. Appears we have a visitor, as ever. You gonna come in? Let's head back to uh, the Lost World, where we're finally going to get the opportunity to meet Professor Challenger. So, if you're sitting comfortably, we'll begin with Chapter 3 of The Lost World. He's a perfectly impossible person. My friend's fear, or hope, was not destined to be realised. When I called on Wednesday, there was a letter with the West Kensington postmark on it, and my name scrawled across the envelope in a handwriting which looked like barbed wire railing. The contents were as follows. Enmore Park, W. Sir, I have duly received your note in which you claim to endorse my views, although I am not aware that they are dependent on endorsement either from you or anyone else. You have ventured to use the word speculation with regard to my statement on the subject of Darwinism, and I will call to your attention the fact that such a word in such a context is offensive to a degree. The context convinces me, however, that you have sinned rather through ignorance and tactlessness than through malice, so I am content to pass the matter by. You quote an isolated sentence from my lecture and appear to have some difficulty in understanding it. You should have thought that only a subhuman intelligence could have failed to grasp the point. But, if it really needs amplification, I shall consent to see you at the hour named, although visits and visitors of every sort are exceedingly distasteful to me. As to your suggestion that I may modify my opinion, I would have you know it is not my habit to do so after a deliberate expression of my mature views. You will kindly show this envelope to my man Austin when you call, as he has to take every precaution to shield me from intrusive rascals who call themselves journalists. Yours faithfully, George Edward Challenger. This was the letter I read aloud to Tarp Henry who'd come down early to hear the result of my venture. His only remark was, There's some new stuff, a couturier or something. It's much better than arnica. Some people have extraordinary notions of humour. It was nearly half past ten before I received my message, but a taxi cab took me round in good time for my appointment. It was an imposing porticoed house at which we stopped, and the heavily curtained windows gave every indication of wealth upon the part of this formidable professor. The door was opened by an odd, swarthy, dried-up person of undeterminate age, with a dark pilot jacket and brown leather gaiters. I found afterwards that he was the chauffeur, who filled in gaps left by a succession of fugitive butlers. He looked me up and down with a searching light blue eye. I expected, he asked. Got an appointment. Got your letter. So I produced the envelope. Right. He seemed to be a person of few words. Following down the passage, I was suddenly interrupted by a small woman who stepped out from what proved to be the dining room door. She was bright, vivacious, a dark-eyed lady, who appeared more French than English to her type. One moment, she said. You could wait, Austin. Step in here, sir. May I ask, have you met my husband before? Uh, uh, no, uh, I, I haven't had the honour. Then I apologise to you in advance. I must tell you that he is perfectly impossible. Absolutely impossible. If you are forewarned, you will be more ready to make allowances. Uh, that, that's most considerate of you, madame. Get quickly out of the room if he seems inclined to be violent. Don't wait to argue with him. Several people have been injured doing that. Afterwards there was a public scandal, and it reflects on me and all of us. I suppose it wasn't about South America you wanted to see him? I could not lie to a lady. 
dear me, this is his most dangerous subject. You won't believe a word he says. I'm sure I don't wonder. But don't tell him so, for it makes him very violent. Pretend to believe him, and you may get through all right. Remember, he believes it himself. Of that you can be assured. A more honest man there has never lived. Don't wait any longer, or he may suspect. Now, if you find him dangerous, really dangerous, ring the bell and hold him off until I come. Even at his worst, I can usually control him. With these encouraging words, the lady handed me over to the taciturn Austin, who had been waiting like a bronze statue of discretion during our short interview, and I was conducted to the end of the passage. There was a tap at the door, a bull's bellow from within, and then I was face to face with the professor. He sat in a rotating chair behind a broad table, which was covered with books, maps and diagrams. As I entered, his seat spun round to face me. His appearance made me gasp. I was prepared for something strange, but not so overpowering a personality as this. It was his size that took one's breath away. His size and imposing presence. His head was enormous, the largest I've ever seen on a human being. I'm sure that should I have had ever ventured to don his top hat, it would slipped over me entirely and rested on my shoulders. He had a face and beard which I would associate with an Assyrian bull, the former florid and the latter so black as to almost have a suspicion of blue, spade-shaped and rippling down over his chest. The hair was peculiar, plastered down in front in a long curving wisp over his massive forehead. His eyes were blue-grey under great black tufts, very clear, very critical, and very masterful. A huge spread of shoulders and a chest like a barrel were other parts of him which appeared above the table, save for his two enormous hands covered by long black hair. This, a bellowing, roaring, rumbling voice, made up my first impression of the notorious Professor Challenger. Well, he said in a most insolent manner, what now? I must keep up the deception for at least a little longer, otherwise here was evidently the end to the interview. Uh, you were good enough to, to give me an appointment, sir, I said humbly, producing his envelope. He took the letter from his desk and laid it out before him. Oh, you are the young person who cannot understand plain English, are you? My general conclusions you are good enough to approve, as I understand. Uh, entirely, sir, entirely. I was very emphatic. Dear me, that strengthens my position very much, does it not? Your age and appearance make your support doubly valuable, though. Well, at least you are better than that herd of swine in Vienna, whose gregarious grunt is, however, not more offensive than the isolated effort of the British hog. He glared at me at the, as the present representative of the beast. Uh, they seem to have behaved abominably, said I. I assure you I can fight my own battles, and I have no possible need of your sympathy. Put me, sir, alone with my back against the wall. GEC is happiest, then. <laughs> well, sir, let us do what we can to curtail this visit, which be hardly agreeable to you and is expressibly irksome to me. You had, as I've been led to believe, some comments to make upon the proposition with which I advanced in my thesis. There was a brutal directness about his methods, which made evasion difficult. I must still make play and wait for a better opening. It had seemed simple enough at a distance. Oh, my Irish wits, could they not help me now when I so need them so sorely? He transfixed me with two sharp, steely eyes. Come, come, he rumbled. I am, of course, a mere student, I said with a facetious smile. Uh, hardly more than I might say as an earnest inquirer. At the same time, it would seem to me that you were a little severe upon Weissman in the matter. Uh, has not the general evidence since that date tended to, well, strengthen his position? What evidence? He spoke with a menacing grin. Well, uh, of course, I'm aware that there is not what you might call definitive evidence, although I merely allude to the trend of modern thought and the general scientific point of view, if I might so express it. He leaned forward 
with great earnestness. I suppose you're aware, he said, checking off points on his fingers, that the cranial index is a constant factor? Naturally, said I. And that telogeny is a subjustice? Un undoubtedly. And that the germplasm is different from the pathogenic egg? Why, why, surely, absolutely, I cried and gloried in my own audacity. But what does that prove? he asked with a gently persuasive voice. I indeed, what does it prove? Shall I tell you, he cooed. Pray do. It proves, he said with a sudden blast of fury, that you are the damnest impostor in London, a vile crawling journalist who has no more science than he has decency in his composition. He'd sprung to his feet in a mad rage in his eyes. Even at the moment of tension, I found time for amazement at the discovery he was quite a short man. His head was not higher than my shoulder. A stunted Hercules, whose tremendous vitality had all run to depth, breadth and brain. Gibberish, he cried, leaning forward, with his fingers on the table and his face projecting. That is what I've been talking to you, sir. Scientific gibberish. Did you think you could match cunning with me? You, with your walnut of a brain? You think you are omnipotent, you infernal scribblers, don't you? That your praise can make a man, or your blame can break him? We must all bow to you, and try to get a favourable word, must we? This man shall have a leg up, and this man shall have a dressing down. Creeping vermin, I know you. You've got out of your station. Time was when your ears were clipped. You've lost your sense of proportion. Swollen gas bags, I'll keep you in your proper place, sir. Yes, sir, you've not got it over GEC. Here's one man who's still your master. He warned you off, but you will still come. By Jove, you do it at your own risk. Forfeit, my good Malone, I claim forfeit. You played a rather dangerous game, and it strikes me that you have lost it. Look here, I said, backing back to the door and opening it. You can be as abusive as you like, but th th there's a limit. You, you shall not assault me. Shall I not? He was slowly advancing in a peculiarly menacing way. But he stopped now and put his big hands on the side pockets of a rather boyish short jacket which he wore. I've thrown several of you out of the house. You will be the fourth or the fifth. Three hundred and fifteen pounds each. That is how it averaged. Expensive, but very necessary. Now, sir, would you not follow your brethren? I rather think you must. He resumed his unpleasant and steady advance, pointing his toes as he walked, like a dancing master. I would have bolted for the hall door, but it would have been too ignominious. Besides, a little glow of righteous anger was springing up within me. I'd been hopelessly wrong before, but this man's menaces were putting me in the right. I'll trouble you to keep your hands off me, sir. I'll not stand it. Dear me, his black moustache and white fang twinkling sneer, you won't stand it, eh? Don't be such a fool, Professor, I cried. What can you hope for? I'm, I'm fifteen stone and hard as nails. I play centre three-quarter every Saturday for the London Irish. I, I'm not the man. It was at that moment he rushed me. I was lucky that I'd opened the door, or we'd have both gone through it. We did a cartwheel together down the passage. Somehow we gathered up a chair upon our way, and bounded on with it towards the street. My mouth was full of his beard. Our arms were locked, and our bodies intertwined, and the infernal chair radiated its legs all around us. The watchful Austin had thrown open the door. We went through it with a back somersault down the front steps. I've seen the two Max attempt something of the kind in the halls, but it appeared to take practice to do it without hurting oneself. The chair went to matchwood at the bottom, and we rolled apart into the gutter. He sprang to his feet, waving his fists and wheezing like an asthmatic. <laughs> Had enough, he panted. Y you infernal bully, I cried as I gathered myself together. Then and there we should have tried the thing out for he was effervescing with fight. But, fortunately, I was rescued from an odious situation 
as a policeman was beside us, his notebook in his hand. What's all this? You ought to be ashamed, said the policeman. It was the most rational remark I'd heard in Enmore Park. Well, he insisted, turning to me. What is it then? The, this man attacked me, I said. Did you attack him? asked the policeman. The professor breathed hard and said nothing. It's not the first time either, said the policeman, severely shaking his head. You were in trouble last month for the same thing. You've blackened this young man's eye. Do you give him charge, sir? I relented. No, I said, I do not. What's that? said the policeman. I, I was to blame myself. I, I intruded upon him. He did give fair warning. The policeman snapped up his notebook. Now, let us have no more such going on, he said. Now then, move on, move on. He said this to a butcher's boy, a maid, and one or two loafers who had collected to observe the scene. He clumped heavily down the street, driving this little flock before him. The professor looked at me, and there was something humorous at the back of his eyes. Come in, he said. I've not done with you yet. The speech had a sinister sound, but I followed him nevertheless into the house. The manservant, Austin, like a wooden image, closed the door behind us. End of chapter three. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, can I ask a favour of yourselves? Um, obviously, I'm reading this more for uh, my nephew, Harrison, and I'm sort of messing around with the voices of uh, Professor Challenger and co. In my head, um, I've always imagined Professor Challenger as essentially Brian Blessed. Um, and you know, I, I'm messing around with these voices, but how do you guys feel this is? Would you prefer me just to read this straight, or you know, shall we carry on as it is? I'm also going to ask Harrison and his mum see what they think, but I'm always interested in opinions from a, a wide range of people. So, I'll say good evening, and I uh, hope you guys have a pleasant evening. Please uh, also make sure you subscribe and like this video, and uh, we'll see you on the next chapter. Take care.